If you have your Bibles tonight, turn with me please to the book, to the book of St. Luke, reading from the 8th chapter, one of the great faith-building passages in the entirety of the Word of God, Luke chapter 8, beginning with verse 40. And it came to pass that when Jesus was returned, the people gladly received him, for they were all waiting for him. Whenever people gladly receive Jesus Christ, great things happen. And behold, there came a man named Jairus. And he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and besought him that he would come into his house. For he had one only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she lay a-dying. But as he went, Jesus, the people thronged him. And the woman, having an issue of blood for twelve years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of blood staunched. It stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude pressed thee and thronged thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me. For I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, notice how it changes. It used the term woman in the beginning. And the woman. But now he changes it to daughter. Be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. I want to use for a subject tonight, preaching a few minutes, chained and changed and claimed. The woman was chained by sin, chained by doubt, chained by fear, chained by sickness, chained by disease. And then was instantly changed, gloriously changed, miraculously changed. And you that watch but television, he can change your life just as quickly. And then instantly claimed by the power of Almighty God and the love of Jesus. Chained, changed, and claimed. Bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, as I minister tonight, I sense your presence. I sense the holy anointing. I sense the power of God. And I pray that as this telecast goes out all over the great country of the Philippines, taped here in Manila, as it goes to the cities and the villages and the towns of the United States and Canada and Brazil, Africa, Australia, all parts, millions of people that it will touch, Somehow that thy spirit will come through. Somehow, O oh God, that we may be able to break the great bread of life. And that our tongue would become as the pen of a ready writer. That these that watch, that these that observe, that these that need thy healing touch, be it physical or spiritual or mental or domestical or psychological, May thy spirit flow and touch them tonight, as well as all that's in this vast Colosseum. And I'll ask it in the name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen and Amen. It's a terrible thing to lose your faith. Man is a spiritual being. You are a spiritual being. And the only thing that an individual really has that is solid 
that is a sure foundation, whomever you may be, wherever you may live, however you may be, is your faith in God. That's the only sure thing. It is a nail, the Bible says, in a sure place. Your faith in God. Your belief in the great eternal creator. Your service for God. That is the foundation and the anchor of a man's soul. To those that would live for materialism, to those that would live for an ideology, to those that would live for the pleasures of life so-called, you'll miss out on so much. But for those that anchor their faith in God and believe in this word and this book, Jesus said, my words are life, my spirit is life, and you shall have eternal life. I was in a great city in the United States years ago in a crusade. One particular Friday night, we had a prayer line. Quite a great number of people lined up to be prayed for, to be anointed with oil. We were believing God for the sick to be healed, physical bodies to be made whole. A few nights before, God had miraculously touched a young man that had a 21-inch steel pin in his leg. He had been involved in a car wreck. That 21-inch steel pin ran down through his leg to hold it together. He Naturally, he had a stiff leg and he would drag it behind him, but God had performed a miracle. Heal that boy's leg. The doctors a few days later removed that pin. He no longer needed it. I saw the pin with my eyes. That was many years ago. I saw him about two months ago. He's still serving Jesus, happy in the Lord. But in this line of people that was to be prayed for for physical healing there was a girl a lovely young lady I did not know her I had never met her I knew nothing of her I found out later that she was attending one of the universities in that city even though she had she had been raised in this church her mother and dad were charter members actually all she had ever known was the Word of God, Sunday school lessons, Bible stories. She had been brought to Jesus at a tender age. But attending the university, she had sit under the teachings of an atheistic professor of education. Little by little, he had undermined her faith in the Word of God. Little by little, through bitter, dripping sarcasm, he had cut her faith in Jesus to the quick. He had made fun of the Bible. He didn't do it bombastically. He just did it little by little with sarcasm. Until that girl's faith in God had diminished until she was so confused she did not know what she believed. And I want to tell you this. There is nothing any more despicable, nothing any more horrendous, nothing any more terrible than a human being that will tear down, that will hinder, that will hurt a person's faith in God and His Word. Her pastor had spent many hours in consolation with her, seemingly to no avail. Her mother and dad, this their only daughter, were worried sick because of her particular condition. She, she lived in a state of unbelief and doubt, and she told them, I want to believe it, but I really cannot bring myself to believe that Jesus Christ was really the Son of God. There's not even any proof she said that God actually existed. 
There is no proof that He exists now. All of these so-called miracles in the Bible, how do we know they happened? Why should we serve someone that lived 2,000 years ago? How does He relate to our problems today? These questions were in her mind, in her heart. Doubt little by little cut down to the recesses of her soul. She told me later, she said, I would sit in that congregation, I would listen to you preach, and I would hear you tell about the power of Almighty God. She said, I would want to stand up and ridicule you and contradict you. I would want to scream out at you, prove what you are saying, prove what you are talking about, prove it scientifically. But for some reason, the girl was in the prayer line. Now, that was a strange place for her to be. Especially when she didn't believe any longer. Especially when she no longer felt that God Almighty existed. Especially when she felt that Jesus Christ possibly was an imposter. But she was in that prayer line. Now listen to me carefully. You listen to me by television. Some of you may laugh and snarl and use your sarcasm and you may have thrown this old Bible under the bed and you may say, I don't need it anymore. I'm living the life of freedom. But it's not easy to turn out the lights that God placed in your soul from infancy. It's not easy, lady, to turn out that light that your godly mother put there when she taught you the Bible stories. It's not easy, boy. You're a man now. You make fun and crack your dirty jokes and use your profanity. You had not been in church in years. The Word of God means absolutely nothing to you. You've joked about it, made fun of it, and thought it's nothing but a mere fable. But way down deep inside, there's a light burning there that was placed there when you attended Sunday school as a little boy a long, long time ago. And you don't shake the glory of God and the Word of God that easily. You see, in spite of all the things she had said, in spite of, of, of all of the confusion and the doubt and the unbelief, way down deep inside, there was a spark of faith still burning. Many of you in this gigantic audience in this arena here in Manila tonight, maybe you've come to this auditorium, this vast, giant coliseum, and you don't really know why you're here. You, you, you've asked yourself several questions since you've been here. Why did I come tonight? Several times you've started to get up and leave. You've thought, I'll, I'll go somewhere else. And thoughts are in your mind that you know are ungodly and unholy. But I'll tell you why you're here. You're here because there's something down inside of you that's drawing you and pulling you and tugging at your heartstrings. And it is the Spirit of Almighty God that's moving on you. It's God still reaching for your soul. Now listen to me carefully. Every attack by Satan Every attack by Satan against you, whether it be physical, spiritual, mental, financial, domestic, or psychological, material, or whatever degree it would take, that attack is for but one purpose, and that is to destroy your faith in God and His Word. Now I want to say that again. Some of you the past few months, you possibly have been going through a turmoil in your soul. Some of you young people here, and Satan is making the greatest attack against young people that he has ever made in the history of mankind. My heart goes out to you boys and girls because you are facing pressures from the spiritual darkness of hell that I never had to face as a young man. The concentrated attacks by Satan is literally pouring down and boring like an auger into your soul. 
but whoever you may be, every attack, whatever direction it takes, your mind may be in turmoil and Satan screaming at you, you might as well go ahead and smoke your pot. You might as well go ahead and take your drugs. You might as well go ahead and drink your beer. You might as well go ahead and live like the others live. You might as well go ahead and do it uh, because everybody else is doing it. That is an attack by Satan to destroy your faith in God until there is nothing left. And Judas, as he cried, I have sinned and I have betrayed innocent blood. And he hung himself because he had lost his faith. When you lose your faith, there is nothing left. Nothing but the leering laughter of sleep. The girl was in that shape. She stood up before me. I had never seen her in my life. I did not know who she was. I knew nothing of her. I knew nothing of the problem. I did not know that she was in this terrible valley of despondency, that she had denied her faith. I did not know that, but God did. I opened my mouth to ask her what was wrong with her. When the Spirit of God checked me, I held up my Bible, one very similar to this one. I still have it in my office at home in the States. I held up my Bible and the Holy Spirit had me choose the words very carefully. I said, young lady, you cannot believe this, can you? Her jaw muscles started to work. She started grinding her teeth one against the other. I saw her eyes fill with tears. She dropped her head and words came very quietly from her lips. And like a sob, she said, I want to, but I can't. I did something I have never done before in my life. Had I thought about it a moment, I probably would not have done it. But the Spirit of God told me to do it. I laid my Bible on the floor. That precious, holy word of Almighty God. And I told that girl in that giant Midwestern city that Friday night, those years ago, I said, stand on the Bible with your feet. Her mouth went open. She looked up at me and she said, literally? I said, literally. That's what the Spirit of God has told me to tell you to do. I've never done it before or since. I could tell as she closed her eyes and you could have heard a pin drop in that gigantic auditorium with thousands of people there that night. I could tell that she was fighting the battle of her eternal soul. I could tell that unbelief and doubt were, was telling her this is foolishness. This is ridiculous. This is ludicrous. This is what I've been telling you. It's senseless. And I can tell that the Spirit of God was working with her mightily and saying, whatever He tells you to do, do it. Like Mary, the precious mother of Jesus, told the men, whatever He tells you to do, do it. Very slowly she picked up her foot, placed it on that precious book. Then slowly she picked up the other foot. And the moment, her second foot touched the Bible. I don't know how it happened or why it happened, but the power of Almighty God hit her. I realize some of you and some of you watching the television, you don't believe in what I'm talking about. You don't believe in the power of God. Serving God is a cold, calculated formula to you. Serving God is a mechanical, without feeling rote to you. Serving God is something that's cold and listless and lackluster and mechanical. But let this preacher tell you this tonight. And let me tell you from the Word of God, God is not a machine. He's not a computer. He lives tonight. And He lives within our soul. Hallelujah. God is a God that can be felt. Jesus Christ is real.
My mother used to sing it a long time ago. My God is real for I can feel Him in my soul. And I don't know what kind of church that you are attending. I don't know what kind of preacher that you are listening to. But if you're serving God as a mechanical religious formula and you're attending church week after week and God is something mysterious and way off and there is nothing in your heart, Jimmy Swaggart is here today to tell you that Jesus Christ lives. That the man that walked the shores of Galilee 2,000 years ago is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The one that opened the blinded eyes lives today. The one that made the lame legs to walk lives tonight. The one that raised the dead is alive this moment. And he's living in my heart. And he's living in my life. And he can break the bonds of sin. He can break the power of drugs. He can break the sordidness of prostitution he can take your life that's without meaning and lift it up above the shadows and plant your feet on higher ground and give you a reason for living glory to God I may be preaching a little bit fast for some of you precious folk but if you can't understand me you can still feel the spirit hallelujah to the Lamb the power of God knocked her flat of her back. I mean flat of her back. Her dress never came above her knees. She came up about two minutes later, saved by the blood of Jesus, her faith restored, speaking in other tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance, filled with the mighty power of the Holy Ghost, set free, and that old terrible bondage of doubt gone, and she was lifted up in Jesus. You know what you need, Assembly of God? You know what you need, Baptist? You know what you need, Catholic? You know what you need, Methodist? You need an old-fashioned transfusion of the glory of all Almighty God in your soul until Jesus becomes real and he's more than a historical figure but he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords praise the Lord all right now I'm going to start preaching the Bible said there was a woman this book is so interesting it is so graphic in its detail. A woman that was not unlike some of you that sit here tonight. She was sick. She had been sick for 12 years, suffering pain and suffering inflammation and suffering disease and suffering constantly seeking help from the physicians seeking help from the doctors and Luke wrote that and Luke was a physician himself for 12 years she had suffered in 12 years she had spent everything she had on the doctors and that's not a diatribe against the medical profession I thank God for doctors. I thank God for good nurses. I thank God for hospitals. They're trying to help people but the Bible merely means that she was not helped. They could not find the answer. She was chained. Chained by doubt and chained by fear and chained by disease. Now listen to Jimmy Swaggart tonight. The chains of bondage that bind humanity that cannot be seen by the eye but they are just as real as ropes that would tie your hand. Is it possible that some of you in this big, huge building tonight are chained by drunkenness? Alcohol? Your life has become a hell on earth. Your family has suffered untold agony because you are chained by this terrible bondage. Is there a sick feeling in the pit of your stomach and you know you can't quit? You want to quit. You've tried to quit. You've watched your little children look at you with sadness in their eyes. And many times tears down their cheeks. And you know what they're thinking. And you hate yourself. But you can't quit. You are chained. Do you know what it is to be chained by lust? Your mind is on filth continuously. 
It seems to dip into a cesspool of iniquity 24 hours a day. Little by little, you've gone deeper and deeper and deeper. You're chained. Maybe some of you here, you never dreamed it would go that far when you put your hand in the till and took your first peso. You thought no one would know you need the money. You put it in your pocket. No one suspected. But now you're getting more and more and more. There's a sick, hollow feeling down deep in your heart. You want to quit, but you're chained. You're in bondage. You remember when some of you uttered your first profanity? It came out of your mouth. You kind of felt big when you did it. And now every word that rolls out is like filth, it's like rot, it's profane, and it dishonors the great name of God. You're chained, you're bound by it. I do not know about your great country, the Philippines, but in the United States of America, one out of every four Americans are suffering mental illness. Think of what I'm saying. They can't face the pressures. They can't face the problems. Some of you here are the same way. They are chained. One out of every four suffer a mental illness. Life has become a merry-go-round and they can't get off. It's become a little bit of hell on earth. Were I to look in the faces of some of you that sat before me tonight, and that would be true of any congregation, I could see on your countenance the signs of a life that's already gone wrong. It shows. It shows in your eyes, some of you. It shows from your heart. Does that mean, Jimmy Swaggart, that God dislikes me, that God hates me? No, 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 no. God loves us. I don't care what we have done how deep the sin may be or how deep the stain and that's why I'm here preaching tonight to tell you you don't have to live that kind of life you don't have to live that kind of way Jesus Christ can break the bonds and the chains of iniquity she was chained I can see her when she gets to Jesus It was not like she thought it was going to be. No doubt in her mind she thought, I will get there. And when I see the miracle worker from Galilee, the one that can open blinded eyes and make lame legs to walk and raise the dead, I will go up to him. And I will appeal to him and I will tell him how I have suffered. And I will tell him how I have hurt. And I'll tell him how the 12 years I've gotten weaker and weaker and I'm dying. And he will take that beautiful hand that healed blind Bartimaeus, that raised the widow's son outside of Nain from the dead. That hand that perform miracles and he will lay it on my head and instantly my sickness will go. He's done it for the others, he'll do it for me. But when she arrived, it wasn't like that. She wanted to get to him, but she couldn't. Thousands of people were there. They were clamoring, they were pushing, they were shoving, they were reaching out. They they were blind, groping, and people trying to lead them to get to Jesus so that he could touch their blinded eyes. The lepers there with their sores running from their their bodies and, and fingers eaten off by that terrible disease. They were there groping and people were saying, get them away, but they were trying to get to Jesus. Parents with little children, sick, suffering with with affliction, were trying to get to him. And there was a mob there, and there was a clamor there. Listen to me. Some of you here, and some of you by television, you have thought in your heart, I want to come to God. 
I want to serve Jesus down deep inside you know you need to there's a hunger there there's a cry out there but the first time you went to church it wasn't like you thought it would be you you, you didn't quite understand folk were raising their hands and waving them toward God others were singing loud and others were up and waving their arms and you didn't understand all of that it was peculiar to you. you you thought that it was not to be that way it was not like you thought it would be coming to God never is when you start to come to God Satan will try to stop you and Satan tried to stop that poor woman 2,000 years ago but let me tell you this you can't stop faith are you listening to me Manila you can't stop faith some of you in this vast audience tonight have sons and daughters or husbands or wives or loved ones that's lost without God and you prayed and cried many tears for them and it looks like they're not going to be saved but you hold your head high you square your shoulders and you tell God they're not going to hell you're going to believe God and they're going to be saved by the blood of Jesus somehow, some way, because you can't stop faith Boy, that's good preaching. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can't stop faith. Faith won't stop when obstacles are thrown in its way. It'll keep on going. Some of you here this evening, when you came to Jesus, little wives, your husbands made it hard for you. They did everything they could to stop you and life became a little bit of hell on earth. But you did not quit. You kept living for Jesus. You kept trusting God. Others told you you were a fanatic. They said you were crazy going to that church where they clapped their hands and where they waved their arms and where they're singing how great thou art and amazing grace. But in spite of the persecution, in spite of them laughing at you, you've gone on anyway and you're getting closer and closer to the Lord Jesus Christ because you can't stop faith well glory to God give the Lord a hand of praise praise the holy name of Jesus I'm telling you I can feel what I'm preaching I can sense it down deep inside. And in spite of demons and devils, the Lord's getting it through to your heart. And by television, God is getting it through to you too. When she got there, she faced a crowd. She couldn't get through it. So many were clamoring and shouting and pulling and shoving. And she was nothing but a little weak woman. She was sick. Rivlets of perspiration start to roll down her face. It's hopeless. The devil tells her you might as well go home. You're out of your mind being here in this mob and this crowd trying to reach this miracle worker. Don't you know that you're going to die here among the tangle of men's legs? But she said, devil, get behind me. I may not can get to him to talk to him. He may not even can hear me in this crowd. But I can touch the hem of his garment. And if I touch the hem of his garment, he will make me whole. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. If I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be made whole. If I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be whole. Woo! Hallelujah! 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 That glorious day 2,000 years ago, angels must have held their breath. God must have looked down from the battlements of glory because he's watching you tonight. 
He's watching you by television. He knows where you live. He knows your name. He numbers the hairs of your head. He knows what size shoe you wear. And He knows how much you weigh. And He knows what comes out of your mouth from your heart. And He's watching you. And if you'll walk toward Him, He'll roll every devil out of the way. And He'll tell you to come to Him. Come all that labor in the heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Jesus had on that beautiful white garment, and around the bottom of it, on each corner, there were four tassels. Four tassels that hung down made of white and in those tassels were a blue thread blue the Jews knew what it meant the Jews knew exactly what it meant they knew that it meant that tassel with that blue thread in it was a sign to them that their help did not come from this earth but it came from heaven <laughs> the blue the color the sign of heaven they knew and when that little sick woman saw that little tassel with that blue in it <laughs> she said my help is coming from heaven my help is coming from heaven <laughs> Glory to God. My help is coming from heaven. And let this preacher tell you tonight, your help is coming from heaven. Your help is coming from Jesus. Your help doesn't come from Jimmy Swaggart. Your help doesn't come from a church. Your help doesn't come from a preacher. Your help doesn't come from a mortal man. But your help comes from heaven. she reached out she reached out she said if I can touch it if some of you Christians here tonight would quit saying I can't do it if some of you would quit saying it's impossible if you but television would quit saying it's hopeless and start saying, as Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. <laughs> Hallelujah! Start saying, by God's help and grace, I'll make it through. Start saying, by God's help and grace, I'm tired of being sick. I will get up and walk in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God. Start saying, if I can touch the hem of His garment, I shall be made whole. And she touched it. Mm, I would love to have been there that day when she touched the hem of His garment. I was chained when I knelt at that old altar. And they told me it was no use to pray. But I reached out and touched Jesus, and He changed me that day. Hallelujah. And she touched Him. <laughs> Glory to God. And the moment she touched Him, she was changed. Instantly. Are you listening to me, Manila? Are you listening to me, Philippines? Are you listening to me tonight? I don't mean a month later. I don't mean a week later. I don't mean the doctor said you take this prescription and you come back and we'll give you a little more. And you come back next week and we'll give you a little more. And you come back next week and you maybe you'll get a little better. And you come back next month and maybe you'll get a little better. But I'm talking about and instantly she was changed by the power of Almighty God. 
instantly, miraculously, gloriously changed. I'm here to tell you that Jesus I serve, He can break the bonds of alcohol from your life instantly. He can break the bondage of drugs from your life instantly. He can break the bondage of sin instantly. He can change you now instantly. Oh, praise God. <laughs> I can see old Splitfoot. You know who he is? The devil. I can see him sneaking away. <laughs> Woo, glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. If you'll walk ahead, he can't stop you. If you'll get that old frown off your face and get a smile on your face and get up every morning and say, This is another day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice therein and be glad. I'm going through by the help and grace of Almighty God. There is nothing the devil can do to stop you. And Jesus stopped. James probably nudged John and said, he stopped. <laughs> Peter probably said, shut up, he knows what he's doing. <laughs> Peter reminds me of me, I'm always putting my foot in my mouth. You don't do that, but I've done it. And Jesus stopped and said, Somebody touch me. For virtue has gone out of me. And Peter steps up and says, Lord, what are you talking about? People are shoving all around you, grabbing at you, and we're, we're, we're working ourselves to death trying to keep them off of you. And you'd say somebody touched you, they're touching you everywhere. Ah, but he said yes. But the one I'm talking about had faith. They believed. <laughs> Glory. <laughs> Virtue is gone out of me. I felt it when faith touched me. You see, this is not a cold mechanical thing. It's not a cold routine. It costs God something to give you what you need. But He gives it freely with love. And that little woman that a few moments before was dying with disease, and many biblical theologians feel that she had cancer of the bloodstream leukemia. And she was dying. For the Bible said instantly her issue of blood stopped. And she was over there praising God and worshiping the Lord and shouting victory. Yesterday she was one of the devil's nobodies. And now she's one of heaven's somebodies. You know what? If, you're uns if you do not know Jesus, the devil doesn't... You're nothing in his sight. If you do not know Jesus, you're nothing in his sight, Satan. But when you come to God, you're more than just a number. Jesus called her daughter. She steps up to give her testimony. She's just a little woman, but she steps up to give her testimony. And the Bible said she told how she touched Jesus, and she was healed immediately. And even Big Peter had to step back. James and John had to step back while this little woman gave her testimony. And she told how she was healed immediately. Now listen to me. Then he reached out and he called her daughter. He called her daughter. He accepted her into heaven's throng and fold. He said, daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Listen to me as I close. One day soon, the trump of the living God is going to sound. And God is going to say, come away, my fair one. Come away, my love. 
And we that have been changed by the blood of the Lamb are going to be instantly claimed. And angels will stand in silence when the redeemed are gathering in. He'll claim us as His own because He loves you and He loves you and He loves you. Would you bow your heads, please?